Hey everybody, I wanted to give you an update on the things that we're continuing to do and learn about cheese making or what I'm what I'm getting up to with it. So this is part two to the last video. And in the last video we were I was mainly talking about we were raw collaborating a lot of the goat's milk, which just means letting it age and curd on its own which is an ancient method of making cheese from goat's milk and very simple. And one, the only issue I was having with that is simply that most of the time the cheese would turn out really great and taste good. And then every once in a while the cheese would curd and all that and we would hang it in a cheesecloth and drain it. And the chev would have like a dirty socks flavor to it, like a dirty socks stinky cheese kind of flavor, which I really didn't like and none of us liked. Um, there was like one batch from a whole gallon of milk that like was so weird and like dirty sock tasting that we just they had it, uh, we just fed it to the dog. So it happened like three times and it was enough for me to just be like, ugh, like I don't like, you know, like wasting a whole gallon's worth of gallon milk's worth of cheese like even though it was only happening every once in a while I was just like huh so what I wanted to <laughs> what are you doing uh, what I wanted to try and what I've been doing now is what is like transferring transferring a culture kind of like sourdough bread or something here this is so funny she's like rubbing her face into the computer screen um, kind of like sourdough bread or other cultured foods where you're like saving a culture and continuing to reuse it in each batch. So that's what I've been doing. It has been hugely successful. I am extremely pleased with it. It's going fantastic. So all I'm doing differently this time is um, when we first got the goats this spring, Joan bought some chev culture, which comes in little packets. And I didn't even know until recently that actually so the packets contain both a culture and rennet, which is weird for making chef. Um, and a culture is a bacterial culture for cheese making. So uh, what I started doing is from a gallon batch of milk that we cultured with that chev culture, I just saved the whey at the end and used that whey, like put a cup of that whey into the next gallon of milk to kind of carry that particular strain of bacteria or bacterias into the next milk to try to see if I could get consistency to see if it would all behave like that particular culture. Um, it's been hugely successful. I recommend it full-heartedly. Um, I will just say it has been, um, it's been an adventure. So it's my kind of craft where it's like 60 to 80% chaos and you just got to roll with it, but it comes out great. <laughs> so, um, you know, I feel like the first few times I did it, I would just save a, a little bit of the whey, put a little bit of the whey into the next, next batch of milk to get it started. And they curded just great. Those milks curded exactly the way that the first milks curded with the store-bought chev culture. But then it was like after each iteration almost of milk, like I would save the way again and, and put it in another batch of milk, another batch of milk. And clearly like the culture continues to evolve and have different generations. And like it doesn't seem to stay completely exactly the same. Um, However, the flavor of the cheese has 100% of the time been the same and fantastic. So the flavor, so now getting consistency with the flavor, good flavor cheese is fantastic. Uh, what hasn't been consistent is that the nature of the curds change all the time. So I was making chev, gallons and gallons of chev, 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 chev. It was all going great. And then randomly like a couple gallons sat for like three days and didn't really curd and I was like what's going on here what is this about 
and I went in there to stir it. And in fact, there was thick curd, but kind of more homogeneously mixed all throughout the milk. And I was like, this is weird. Wait a minute, this looks like yogurt. This smells like yogurt, this tastes like yogurt. So we had two gallons the same week actually just turn into yogurt, which is freaking amazing. Um, Joan had made goat yogurt from our goat's milk, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago with a, a, yo a store-bought yogurt culture and uh, I think did the thing where you got to keep it at like 80 degrees. It's like you got to keep it at a specific temperature for a certain amount of time and like incubate it. And the yogurt was fantastic. But this happened like in like the low 70 degrees in the house, just culturing open air for three days. And it just like churned into yogurt. So I was like, okay, which with the goats, the goats make a very thin watery yogurt. So when Joan made the first batch of yogurt, they, sh they did strain it, like put it in, put the yogurt in a cheesecloth and strained it a little bit to just get out some of the excess l liquid. It's like whey, probably is. So I did the same thing where I just like strained them for a while, a good while, maybe a couple of hours until they kind of thickened up a little bit into more of a typical yogurt consistency. And we're still eating through that because that was like two gallons worth of yogurt. Uh, so one gallon of milk made like three quarters of a half gallon jar of yogurt, which was really good. It, the yogurt had a... A uh, nice creamy texture. It didn't have as strong of a bite as our normal yogurt did. It was a little milder taste, uh, but fantastic. So we were like, that's cool. We got yogurt without having to do all the crazy stuff to get yogurt. So I consider that a success because it still made a great food and it's really nice for us to like be able to switch up the cheeses because like chev is great but like eating just chev at every meal every once in a while I, you want a little diversity so having yogurt is fantastic um and then some other funny things started to happen excuse me excuse me excuse me <laughs> uh started to happen just this past week now so the original chev culture supposedly now the bacterial culture is supposed to be active to work like anywhere between 68 degrees and 80 something so like a very normal kind of room temperature range of temperatures and uh, and in the farmhouse here which is on grid it's usually somewhere in the 70s and um, so all the milks were culturing in the house all summer long they all did great and then just this past week, I think the temperatures got, you know, the temperatures in the house got cooler. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. Mold remediation and a dehydrating and a dehydrator to get the moisture out of the air, all that stuff. So maybe the house is a little cooler or the culture has simply evolved over time to need a warmer temperature. So I had two gallons of milk that sat on the kitchen table for three days and didn't seem to curd. Now that's long enough. Three days I expect them to curd. So I'm like, huh, what's going on? And I tried to, they were really loose, like a really thin, thin yogurt. And I was like, maybe they just made yogurt again. I'll strain them. But when I strained them, you know, you through a tight cheesecloth, you expect whey to drip out of the bottom. Whey looks different than milk. It's, it's more translucent, kind of yellowish cream. And instead, it was more of a milky white liquid that was straining out of them. So I was like, this is just, this is not good. I hope I didn't ruin two gallons of milk. So Joan said, oh, well, you know, why don't you just put them back on the stove and make a farmer's cheese out of them, which is another of the cheese methods we do where we put the milk on the stove and bring it up to a, t a higher temperature of 190 then add like a cup of lemon juice, a ton of lemon juice, and that curds curds the milk really quickly. Um, that's one of the other cheeses that we make, uh, but it's just a very tasteless cheese. It takes away, heating the, heating the milk like that takes away all the goaty taste. So the, the, the curds are almost tasteless, which is good if you want to make a flavored cheese and you can like mix in other stuff and make like dessert cheeses or whatever. 
I just don't like it because it's flavorless and it's really crumbly and dry. Um, but we were like, well, that might be just a way to get the milk to curd and save it. So I put it on the stove and I started warming it up just a pinch. And I had a thermometer, thermometer in there. And the milk started out in the low 70s degrees. And I it only heated a few, temp a few degrees. Uh, maybe it got to like 75. And all of a sudden, it just spontaneously starts curding very quickly right in the pot. As if I had added lemon juice, but I hadn't even, barely even raised the temperature. Um, and I was like, oh my god, this milk was just, so the, the, the culture is spread all throughout here. I can taste it. It tastes kind of yogurty and sour. But it needed just that little raise of temperature in order for the curds to form and, and solidify. I was like, this is amazing! So within five minutes, the curds just formed. Um, and this is still, like, I didn't even raise the temperature above 80. Uh, and, yeah, within, like, five minutes they formed, and I was able to just strain the cheese like usual, and it made a fantastic shove, like always. It tasted the same, had pretty much the same texture and same flavor. I did that to the second gallon, it worked great. I've done that to two more gallons now, so it's happened four times this week to four gallons of milk. Uh, and it's just funny, and it's all worked out, and it's made four more batches of fantastic show. So I'm saying all this to say that every single batch of milk I have, uh, you know, like inoculated in this way, or I'm continuing to transfer the live culture, every batch has turned out fantastic. They're all edible and delicious. They're just not consistent. You gotta like keep rolling with it. So I definitely encourage this because for one, you're not buying, you're not depending on some products like buying a culture and using a packet of culture for every single gallon of milk that you're making into cheese on your own. So you don't have to buy any products at all. And, and yet you can have consistency in your cheese. Um, yeah, I, I just, I was so shocked that, like, a chev culture would have rennet included in it, animal rennet, because um, it's completely unnecessary. It's, it almost bo it borders on immoral to me to put animal rennet in a culture for making soft goat chev, okay? Because, for one, you do not need rennet whatsoever, ever, 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 period, no. You don't need rennet to make soft goat cheese. It's insane. It's ridiculous. The whole point of rennet is to curd milk into hard curds so that you can make hard cheeses, particularly with cow, but also to make hard cheeses with goat and goat and sheep milk. Um, so, like, that's just freaking ridiculous. Like, what a waste of rennet. Uh, you know, like, like, rennet is a precious thing. It's a heartbreaking thing. It comes from the guts of baby calves. You know, that are either slaughtered or that died from natural causes. Um, so, like, save that for when you need it to make hard cheese, which is long-lasting and that you can store so you can have food later in the season. You know, so just, it's so stupid. So, with uh, goat milk, it's my understanding so far that as milk simply ages, it sours. So it's that souring that's sort of acidifying the milk and that's curdling the milk on its own. Okay, so it's, it's that souring that is making the curds to begin with. A culture, a bacterial culture, is simply affecting the character of those curds. Like, so, yeah, so what am I trying to say? Oh my god, mowers. One of my least favorite tools in the universe. Anyway, um, so a culture, a culture is not going to affect whether or not the goat milk is going to curd. The goat milk is going to curd, no matter what, if it's raw. Um, the culture, to my understanding, affects the nature of the curds. So like, the texture of the cheese, the flavor of the cheese, the keeping quality of the cheese, that sort of thing. It was so cute earlier, you couldn't quite see it on the camera. Rosie 
was like pressed her whole side of the face against the back of the computer screen like this for like 10 minutes just like quietly creepily just like pressed there just like mm, like a cat like a cat when they like curl up to the computer while you're trying to work you're just like oh like what are you doing it's, it's weird and it's cute but it's also it's like they know where the attention is at the the focus of attention <laughs> just eating a lot of white vervain right now um yeah so anyway um this is all pretty basic stuff um it's working it's working wonderfully uh i have also been freezing some of the whey um, joan read online that's something you can do i tried it it works so some days i'm making new batches of cheese on the same day when i am uh, drain, draining other cheeses, which means that I have whey fresh, ready to use to transfer to the next gallon of milk. Some days I don't. So what I've just been doing is every time a cheese comes out nice and I like it, then I save the whey from it and I just pour the whey into those little ice cube trays that you put in the freezer. So you have little frozen whey cubes and then I keep all of those in the, in the shed freezer. So if it's a day where I don't have fresh whey, I just pop out some of the whey cubes and I'm literally just like taking a cold gallon of milk out of the refrigerator, plopping in three or four or five or six or seven whey cubes into it. It's cold. Put a cheesecloth on it, stick it on the table. That's it. That's all I do. And I wait two days. I wait a day or two for it to do its thing. Because unlike, unlike rennet, rennet does need milk to be at a certain high temperature in order to work because the whole function of rennet is that in a baby calf's gut while the baby calf is still suckling nursing and isn't on any solid food at all like no green grasses yet nothing just 100 percent milk uh, in the body of the baby calf which is a high temperature internally in the body um, that naturally occurring rennet in their guts is what helps them to digest the milk because it's 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 separating the milk and solidifying it so it functions at a warm temperature so you got to like make the milk the temperature of like the inside of a body uh, cultures are not like that uh, you don't so I'm not warming the milk that's why it works like the milk the milk gradually warms up to room temperature on its own. When it gets there, the culture thaws and it starts working as well. So it's very easy. Very easy. Um, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of, like, relying on electricity. I'm not a fan of relying on freezers. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate it. Um, but, you know, right now we're doing, like, a blend. A blend of conveniences and old things um, just to get by you know like we're fucking busy uh, trying to manage all the tasks that we have and just using using what we have so um, that's what's going on but clearly this makes it really easy to deal with milk without refrigeration without any modern stuff at all okay it just it translates so easily so that's kind of my my little intro and catch up on the cheese. So fantastic. Um, so after this, uh, I did make cheese today, like every day. Um, but I, I made a video of me making the chef and doing all these steps so you can actually see it. Um, so that's right after this. I hope you enjoy. It's starting to become evening here and starting to get near to milking time. <laughs> it's just <laughs> all of life revolves around the milk. As soon as I finish cleaning up from cheese making, it's time to start setting up for milking and then to clean up from milking and and then it starts all over again the next morning. <laughs> it's great. But it's a lot. Three three goats in milk is a lot. You know, there's three of us on the property here. Well there's four of us. There's three of us. Um doing the goats and we only intended to have two milk goats this year we ended up with four goats downsized to three in milk and uh, three 
seems a lot. I wouldn't do it again. I would probably ever only want to do two goats and milk at once. Oh, Rosie. The way you chew your cud. Mm, it's truly sensational. Sensational. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enjoy. This cheese, I brought a prop. I brought a prop this whole video and I forgot to hold it up. See? Cheese, this is the chef. <laughs> Many, many, many jars of this. I have a whole freezer full of jars of this. Filled up to the tippy top of this. But you gotta watch the whole rest of the next video. To watch me spread it on a plate and taste it. God, it smells sweet. It almost smells like ice cream right now. How is it even possible? It's the most delicious food in the world. <gasps> so fantastic. It's so good. Hey, it's cheese making day, except that it's cheese making day every day, so it's not really an occasion. <laughs> it's milking day every day, it's cheese making day every day, it's cleaning up after milk and cheese every single day. Um, but this is cool, so I thought I could actually show you a walkthrough of what I'm doing. This was Joan's idea to actually film a little bit of it today. It's so simple. So today I'm making chev. I'm almost always making chev. We make three different types of cheese. One is a raw cultured chev, which I've kind of gotten into the rhythm of doing now, which is like the least labor and we have to buy zero products for it. <laughs> uh, the second is a farmer style cheese, which is drier and crumblier and tasteless. But some people don't like the sharp goaty flavor of chev and they want a tasteless crumbly cheese. Not me. Um, but with that we use lemon juice. So we heat the milk to 190 degrees on the stove, add a ton of lemon juice, and curdle it that way. Uh, I only do that if I have to. And the third type of cheese is also that farmer style with the lemon juice, but we hang it a little bit longer and chill it, and it makes like a, kind of like a big mozzarella ball. It's like our version of mozzarella. It's really easy, but it's nice. Um, but I'm mostly making chev. It's creamy, super creamy, just the right amount of tang. It's my favorite. We eat it with every meal. So that's what I'm doing constantly. Here we go. So when I'm getting ready to make more chev, like today, all I'm doing is I'm taking the milk straight out of the refrigerator. So here's our shed refrigerator, which is just full of milk. So the jars of milk are, you know, small amounts per each milking of the goat. So what I'm doing is I just take the super cold milk, I don't even heat it up, and just combine them enough that I'm filling uh, a one gallon jar. So a one gallon and a one gallon. And I have been keeping, we all have been keeping the different goat's milk separate just for our educational purposes, but it actually hasn't made a difference. Um, the milk of all three breeds of goats hasn't really behaved differently enough with curdling to warrant doing that, so it's fine to mix them. So, uh, so taking the smaller jars, filling it up, but here's the thing is that I actually don't want to fill them up all the way because I'm going to be adding some of the old warm way from the cheese I'm draining today and I'm going to add it into this. So see like this one's filled to the brim and that's too much. So I'm going to take some of this out until it's down to here, pour it into here so that I have two gallons with some headspace in there and then I'm going to bring them into the kitchen. So these are ice cold. These are ice cold and this is milks that are you know ranging from uh, one to two to three to four to five days old in the refrigerator. It's all good. So there's my two gallons of milk ready to go. You can see just a little bit of headspace in each one. Um, so I'm usually doing uh, about, two, I usually do about two gallons at a time. It just depends. Um, right now, kind of at the end of summer with the three goats, I really need to be doing like two gallons every other day or else I get backed up. Um, so at least a gallon a day 
Today I'm going to do three gallons because I'm pretty backed up. Um, and it doesn't. You can use the warm, fresh milk also. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it doesn't matter if your milk is fresh and warm, or if it's cold and iced, because this Chev method is so freaking simple that you don't have to give a shit about what the temperature of the milk is. You don't need a thermometer. By the way, then this is what my life consists of just washing milk jars all day long every day piles and piles of milk jars <laughs> okay so here's the three gallons of milk i brought into the kitchen table they're still cold and this is pretty much where they will stay for about uh one and a half to two to sometimes three days so i happen to be draining some cheese right now. So here's a bucket. Uh, here's some cheese that's that's draining, draining out the way before I hang it. Um, which is just to say that uh, all the whey is here in the bucket, so I have some nice fresh warm whey to use, so that's what I'm going to use to move my culture into the new jars. Okay, I got the cheese out of the way. <laughs> I got the cheese out of the way of the way. So here's the way at the bottom. It looks kind of yellowish in this light. But mainly it's kind of like a cloudy, clear, slightly yellow liquid. I don't know. I just take about a cup, a cup of it. Uh, so far it hasn't really mattered the amount. Like I've done as little as like three ice cubes worth or sometimes a cup or a cup and a half. It doesn't seem to make a difference. And I take the old way and just pour it into the new cold milk. Top it off just like that. And then uh, I'll put a cheesecloth over it and tie it in place just to keep the bugs out. And it's just gonna stay here on the table for like a day or two or three. That's literally it. So I'm gonna do that for all these jars. Ta-da! See, this is easy. So, all that, all that is happening when I'm moving the old way from the old batch of cheese to the new way is that I'm ensuring that I'm like inoculating the new milk with that particular bacteria strain or strains that were in the last one that made a tasty cheese. So, as I've talked about in the previous video, you absolutely don't have to do this at all. You could just leave this raw milk on the table, adding nothing for two or three days, and it will clabber on its own beautifully. It's just a little bit more of a wild card about which bacterial cultures will curd it, so the flavor of the cheese is slightly more of a wild card, except that 60 to 80 percent of the time it still turns out absolutely delicious. But this method is giving me a tiny bit more actually much more consistency. So we actually haven't had a single cheese taste bad at all doing this. Okay, so from here on out, after the cheeses, sorry, after the milks just sit on the countertop for a day or two, they're going to clabber, and they clabber in all different ways. So that's what I talked about in the preamble at the beginning of this video. So if you didn't watch that, now's the time to go back to what I'm talking about. So the curds can look all kinds of different ways, and sometimes they're nicely bunched at the top of the jar and they look beautiful, um, and then other times, like, like I mentioned, we've got an actual straight-up yogurt, but here is something really interesting um, that's been happening just the past week. So, um, no matter how the milk curds look, you know, you, if you can scoop them out with a slotted spoon enough to put them in your cheesecloth and drain them and hang them that way, great. Most of the time I can't, so I'm just gradually pouring the whole jar uh, into a cheesecloth and just slowly letting it all drain, which is a little messier, it takes a little bit longer, but it works great. But here's something that's been happening just the past week uh, particularly as the temperature in the house I think has gotten a little cooler where the milk is sitting out for about three days so it should have curded by then um, 
and it has a very, very, very thin yogurt consistency. Super thin, almost as thin as milk, but not quite. But I can tell that it has the sour, yogurty, curded taste, but the curds still haven't really formed. Um, and what I realized is that they just need like three to five degree temperature difference. They're at about like 70 degrees and they really need like 75. So this is really cool. Um, this is just a nerdy, dorky thing, but I wanted to show it to you because it's really fun. So the milk has sat uh, with a cheesecloth on it for two to three days. I can tell it's, it's sour, it's good, it tastes good, like nicely sour and curded. So all I'm doing is putting it on the stove to heat it a little bit. I'm just bringing it up like three to five degrees and you're going to watch it. All of a sudden it's going to curd before your eyes, which is pretty cool. It curds as if it looks like you're pouring in a cup of lemon juice. Um, it happens that fast. It's so cool. So here's the milk jar that's been aging and it's ready to go. It's just like a really loose, loose, the loosest curd ever. It's dark in here. I'm not gonna be able to focus super great with the camera. I'm just gonna pour it into a pot to be able to heat it up a little bit more. So again, this isn't what I'm doing all the time. We haven't done this all summer. It's just a funny little fluke thing um, recently and it's just fun. So I wanted to show it to you. So, but to, for me to reiterate, if the curds, the white curds are nicely bunched on the top, great, pour it into a cheesecloth and drain it. If the curds are kind of like on the bottom bunched, great, pour it into a cheesecloth and drain it. If the curds are kind of homogeneously formed throughout the whole jar, but they're lumpy or like a thick yogurt all the way through, but you can tell they're clumpy, great, pour it into a cheesecloth and drain it. They look all different ways. This is just that like, there's not really even enough curd separated from the whey. See, it looks like thin yogurt. And if I pour this through a cheesecloth, what's gonna drain out of the cheesecloth isn't gonna be whey. It's gonna look like white milk still which I don't want. I want the whey to be separate. So here we go. Okay, so the whole gallon of super loose yogurty consistency sour milk is in the pot and I just turned on the heat. Um, so right now, I mean it feels cold but it's the room temperature in here. And so I'm not really, I'm not cooking it. I'm literally just raising the temperature a few degrees. Um, so obviously we could just like be clabbering the cheeses outside. Oh my God, here, wait, it's happening. Look, it's happening so fast. Look what's happening on the edges. Da, 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 da. Isn't that amazing? So this has happened to four gallons so far this past week. This is so cool, look how fast it's curding. So you're seeing the way this light translucent liquid separate out from the whites and the whites are starting to clump together. Oh God, it's so cool. It's amazing. And I did use a thermometer the first time I did this and it really was just like, uh, after about 75 degrees, it kind of, curded completely and that was it and I kept raising the temperature to like 80 and 85 maybe it went to 90 on that one and it really didn't do anything more um, it just it just needed those few extra degrees so it the whole thing happens in like five minutes and then it's curded and ready to strain and this is like slightly warm it's still like pretty much not much warmer than room temperature. Look at that. So it's still going and I'm just gonna wait for like until I stop seeing movement in the curd. And um, this doesn't make a really hard curd. It's still a very soft loose curd typical of a lot of our chef cheeses. So like you know it's not thick, big, globby things you can pick up. But you see that the whites are holding together enough now and they're separate from the whey. And that's really all you need. And that's what I'm going to 
strain through my cheesecloth now. That's it. That's the curd. It's so beautiful. And it's probably going to keep going. I'm going to probably let it go for another five minutes just to make sure it's all done. Okay, so here's the real loose curd. And, uh, you know, it's looser than, than when the milk curds thick on its own, like it was doing during the summer. But uh, the cheese comes out tasting exactly the same and with the exact same texture for the most part. So all I'm going to do is just, you know, gradually take all of this through the cheesecloth here. And it does drain pretty quickly. So it looks really loose and white, but just trust me, it's going to drain into a fabulous cheese. Fabulous, fabulous. And we're usually hanging... Um, I use a colander here to like for the bulk of the whey to drain out, which usually happens in half an hour. Um, and then I string up, string up the cheese and like this in this bucket so that it's hung up. And usually drip it for a day uh, or two days. So I won't take this cheese down. I just hung it up. I won't take it down until tomorrow or the next day because um, it takes that long, like if you feel this, it's very, very wet and loose. So it takes that long for it to feel firm enough to be the consistency we like. But that's all preference, like it's just a matter of like how dry you like your cheese or how wet you like your cheese. Uh, totally, totally preference. So sometimes I'll just hang like two or three or even four cheeses crammed up in a bucket like that. Doesn't really doesn't really matter, not a big deal. That's it. Okay, and there, now you can see the cheese has been draining for 15 minutes or so. Uh, the liquid has gone down a lot. You can hear it's still dripping. And you can just see how, like, the solids are really formed in there. So I just take a spoon and I kind of scrape down the sides like that. And then uh, hang up the cheesecloth for a couple of days. That's it. So here's the cheese. It's so good. Many, many jars like this of cheese. Chev is the best cheese in the world. Okay. <laughs> about a gallon of milk makes about, you know, this, uh, what is this, a pint of Chev. And that's the consistency. This is cold. So it's like creamy and dense, but also very fluffy. It's weird that it's like very wet and very fluffy at the same time. That's its texture. Ah, it's so good. Adding it to my lunch. Huge, just huge old mounds to every meal. Or just like a slice of bread piled with chev with fresh tomatoes from the garden on it. Stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's a very wet, creamy chev. Very sticky. And like has that little bit of sour bite that's so great in shove, but it's just right. It's not too much. It's not too bland. Mm. It's just so good. Well, there's a little slice of our goat life at the moment and our kind of semi-modern, semi-primitive cheese method <laughs> blend of old and new. Hi, Rosie. <laughs> Uh, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. If you're not already, know that you can support me making these videos by joining my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Storms of Daylight is the only support I have for making these videos, which takes so much time. It's sick. So much time. Um, I hope they've been helpful. Those of you who don't know, this is my favorite of the goats. <laughs> it's no secret. Rosie's the best, and her milk is the best. She was never robbed of her horns. Ugh, I just, I'm, I love the other goats, but I just, uh, it hurts me seeing goats without horns. They deserve horns. It's also interesting that Rosie here, who's uh, the La Mancha, you can see her weird earlessness, um, part of her breed. Um, I have to say that her, mil her milk is a little fattier than the other two goats. Uh, and you notice it. It's creamier. It's 
it's delicious. It's it's the milk that we drink. And um, in general, it's not a rule, but in general, her milk makes more cheese volume of milk than the other two goats. So like, if I do a half gallon of her milk, it makes enough chev cheese to almost fill a pint jar. Whereas when I do a gallon of milk from either of the other two goats, it makes enough cheese to cram into a pint jar to like, I gotta really cram it in there. So it's not that Rosie's milk makes double the amount, but almost a good third or fourth more. It's hard to tell sometimes that if that happens all the time or not, but it's consistent enough that I like the fattier milks. I like the higher milk fat content goat milks because I'm a fat worshiper, as you know. She gets earwax. She likes her ears <laughs> just like, well, sometimes I don't know if she likes it or doesn't like it, but I gotta kind of get that earwax out. All right, that's all for now. Bye-bye, everybody. Say bye-bye, Rosie. Meh. <laughs> She's fucking adorable and such an asshole at the same time. Bye.